So for those of you who don't know, um, my name is Hannah and I'm a program director at Build It Green. We're hosting this series to help uh, bring regenerative principles to a larger audience. Um, this is the third session of four. Our last one is January 7th. If you've been with us before, you'll recognize in today's session, we're gonna talk about four of the principles that we've talked about in the past, but start to go a little bit deeper and show how they show up uh, in a few case studies in a more detailed way. So really start to get into how they show up and how you can begin to use them, especially thinking at the neighborhood scale um, and kind of getting out of the project mindset, which we often uh, approach work with. So that's what we're gonna cover today. Uh, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna have one small breakout. Don't worry, very low stakes. Uh, where we want to, one, get an opportunity for folks to chat a little bit, but two, to start to think about how you begin to apply these principles to the way that you're thinking and the work that you're doing. So we'll have a little breakout. And then again, like we've done in the past, after the presentation, we'll have a question and answer period um, where we'd love to hear any questions that you have. Feel free to post them in the chat as we go, as they occur to you, and we'll revisit them in the question and answer period, or you know, write them down on a piece of paper. If you're more tactile, that's also fine. Um, without further ado then, I'd like to pass the mic to Bill and Joel to take it away. Thanks so much for being here, everyone. Thank you, Hannah. Let me shift my screen to share. Right. So we are on the third session, folks, of the 100 series. And we are spending a fair amount of time on the principles. Um, and we know that this may be repetitive, yet these, we, what we are doing is deepening their and expanding what they're applied to, uh, and then deepening our understanding of how they're working. I want all of us, if you will, to hold in, your, in the back of your mind the concept of innate potential. We're really touching on that tonight, what it means in terms of working expanding our world of working on projects. So the four principles, we're going to be emphasizing four principles tonight. Work with whole systems, work with potential, not problems, work with nested systems, and find nodal interventions. Just so you know, for those of you who are actually following the numbers, we are not following them in order. So we're following them in what conceptually makes sense. Um, so here we go. Joel, we're gonna dive in. You're muted, Joel. Joel, you're muted. We're gonna start with a little breakout. It's only gonna be five minutes. You're gonna be with two other people and we're just gonna ask you to think about a place that you care about because tonight's focus is about place. So we've gone through these principles in various orders to focus on different aspects of them. We're gonna work on four principles tonight. Um, and as Bill said, they're going to be out of order from the one we've been using. So don't spend your time being distracted by that. So um, one of the things that distinguishes regenerative development is rather than treating every place as generic as typical real estate development often does, is we're looking at what is unique about specific places. And so one of the ways into understanding um, places we care about or what we value about places so we could develop that value is um, what is it that you're proud of? What is it that you share with visitors? So when people come to visit you, where do you take them? Do you take them to the beach, to the mountains? Do you take them downtown? Do you stay in your backyard? Do you visit your work? Um, and what is it about those places you take people to that attracts you? And um, what does that tell you about what you value about this place? So you're going to have to have brief answers in this five minutes you've got. And um, we might hear about some of your reflections, but we'll probably wait until the question and answer period. So you'll get an invitation to go into a breakout group. You'll have to in accept that invitation. And then after five minutes, you'll automatically be whisked back here.
Okay. Great. Um, so I'd love you guys to hold in mind your conversation as we work through the rest of this series. And um, we'll come back to this along with the definition at the beginning when we start the question and answer period. So now to some perspective on whole systems. We've used this definition before, but in the context of what we're beginning to work on in place, this, the title of this session this evening is, is uh, working with neighborhoods. And the question about holes is what hole are we working with? The universe, North America, California, San Francisco, East Bay. Um, what's important is to understand that a hole is experienced, and we'll read the definition, as something that is singular, meaning it's an entity. It's unified, it's coherent. It's vital, it's alive, because we're working with living systems and it's developing or it's evolving. So that means that we're not working with objects or things, working with living systems, whether it's a human being, a family system, um, and so on. Oops. So the important thing about this work that we're trying to emphasize is that while a project could be seen as holding all the people in it and all the living systems on the property, et cetera. Most people think about the project as the building or the, the thing you're building. And that's what we're shifting. We're not just talking about something that suffers entropy or decays. We're actually talking about things that actually are alive and continue to evolve and improve because living systems actually are generate uh, uh, higher and better uh, relationships with themselves and each other. So with regeneration, the focus is on the system and its aliveness, and then the role the project plays in that system. So in this case, we're going to be, or for this evening, we're going to be considering the neighborhood or the immediate whole system. And the point of this is, is that each whole has to add value to the next whole. And that hole adds value to the next hole. That allows us to begin to actually understand and work consciously with how we can actually contribute to what we call value adding processes or those processes that can improve life. So holes are then nested and this we've taken out of order uh, in order for us to understand whether it's an individual, a family, a community, we're actually working with all of those, but the important part is that we are generating value between each of those holes. Um, we use the uh, example of Brattleboro Co-op, and we'll go into that in a little more detail again in the context of this. The building and the community was right here, but the operating neighborhood, if you will, was the farmland around this project and its relationship to the food that it supported. So. The, the sizes of these neighborhoods depend on the focus of the project as well. There's no rule for this uh, kind, of, um, kind of work. We have to actually understand what's important and what value we actually can exchange. This principle of work with potential, not problems, we're looking at the potential of the neighborhood, as Bill said. We're looking at the potential of the system and how does the project enable that larger whole as a part of to realize its, its potential. Go ahead, Bill, the next slide. All right, so um, we have this belief, this hypothesis that every person, every place has unique potential, right? Um, and I wanna go back for a second to this the idea of holes. So there's this really useful Buckminster Fuller story and he's explaining thinking in holes to his students and he makes a circle on the ground with his toe and he says the first thing to think in holes and understand holes is to bound it you can't think about it or talk about it unless you create some kind of boundary around it and that might be your neighborhood it might be an ecosystem it might be an organization it might be um a mountain let's say or a watershed and then he rubbed out that line with his foot, that circular line with his foot and said, and then the next thing you need to do is realize that that's a useful fiction. That of course, there are no boundaries between these whole systems. They're just important to create those boundaries so we can talk about them. And work with them. And work with them. And so um, 
we have two pictures here. One is an image from here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I live, and one is a kind of generic strip mall. And um, one of the beauties about the living world is that every place, every person, every student, every piece of wood is unique. And so how do we bring out that uniqueness? So tonight we're considering the uniqueness of neighborhoods and how we can bring out that potential, how we can think about a project as a whole nested within a larger whole so that we can enable that potential to be brought out through what we're working on. All right, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, and the way we do this is by looking for those nodal interventions that enable those unique potentials to reveal themselves, to express themselves, to unfold. Next one, please, Bill. Right, so um, one of my favorite examples to think about is cheese and bread and beer, any fermented thing, right, that I have this, um, that when I add yeast to the dough, it enables that dough to express its potential, right? It's a tiny little addition. That's why Jesus said, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. It's this invisible thing that inspirits that soggy dough and makes it crispy and fluffy and heavenly to eat. And it's a similar thing with the, the cheese or the beer that it entirely changes um, our experience of um, the milk or the grain, um, and makes it an entirely different reality. And it, um, this tiny little difference unfurls this kind of potential. Okay, next one, Bill, please. Oops. All right. So with those four principles defined, we're gonna take a look at them in context with three of the case studies. A couple of them you know, another one we're introducing and uh, deepening our conversation about them. So sorry for the repetition, but often people say it's actually a good idea to keep deepening our understanding of these things because it, it increasingly has uh, unfolded like an onion unfolding. So the so I just want to say one thing, please hold in mind the conversation you just had for five minutes because the key to finding potential and the nodal interventions is to look at what it is that attracts you to a place, right? What makes it, um, because you're attracted to that potential within it, right? Go ahead, Bill, please. Yeah, so when we, we were hired to work on the Brattleboro Food Co-op and they wanted a lead gold building, what we became sensitive to, not only of a food, larger food system, is that Vermont resonates to its landscape. It's a, um, they resonate to local food for one thing, strong communities, and, uh, but the idea that they are farmers at heart in some, way, in some ways, this, main, this same approach may not have appealed to a grocery store in New York City, but in Vermont, it was very powerful because that energy and, if you will, potential was there. If you so, ask people why they live in Vermont, they're most likely to say it's because of the landscape. It's because of this working landscape where um, people have been integrated into it for a very long time. Yeah, it's just not nature. It actually is a, is a human nature uh, place. So the whole system that we identified there was not only food, but the land that supported food, the farming that goes on the land, and the community that supports that farming. And You'll see, in fact, I'm going to just jump ahead for a second. This is the, what is the biggest festival in Brattleboro, and it's called the Strolling of the Heifers. So they celebrate the dairy industry, their cows and farmers, in a very powerful way. So it wasn't very hard to see this. Um, but also the nested systems that are there allowed us and them to discover more potential. So for instance, Yes, the land was degraded and needed help and the farmers were leaving and how do we bring the farmers back? So that mutually, mutual value, adding relationship between the farmland and the town. Not only that though, is that because it was a co-op system, they actually went to even a greater hole, a greater neighborhood, if you will, of the related um, cooperatives and became a, they became a cooperative network. It was the first time that had happened in the Northeast. And so the potential we saw was that the land could be revitalized, the localization could be actually made to be realized, 
and the food system and community relationship could be further strengthened. It was already there. We weren't pushing an idea on them. It existed. It was up for us to work with them to understand that. And the nodal interventions was that it was a working landscape and the, and the local food resource really resonated to them. So that allowed for all sorts of, if you will, non-project related activities to be sponsored or inspired uh, and motivated by the work by working this way on that grocery store. So um, in this case study that again we've talked about before this is Brad Lancaster's house here on the corner um, in Tucson, Arizona and one of the things when you ask people in Tucson why they love it it's because it is this warm desert place but it has these serious monsoon rains in the late summer that make the wild areas throughout the Sonoran Desert really lush and really productive and really diverse um, wildflowers and all kinds of edible plants. Next one, please, Bill. And so we realized that the whole system we were working on was the urban Sonoran Desert and that the nested system was this project within his neighborhood of Dunbar Springs and striking it used to be called Dunbar Springs because there was in fact a spring there. And that was nested within the whole of Tucson. Right. Next one, please. And that by um, planting the water as that nodal intervention, um, it changed people's view of the place and they could see its potential as a lush desert city that was shaded by all these trees. So it wasn't just harsh, hot pavement and concrete. And this potential that was seen by watching Brad do this weird thing of cutting through the curb cuts, planting that water and planting trees following planting the water began to transform his neighborhood, which you could see over here on the right, the neighbors getting together to do this up and down the block and then spreading throughout the city of Tucson and beginning to turn it back into a lush desert city. Okay, next one, please, Bill. And this last case study is about a um, construction company that I used to be a part owner of. And one of the natures of this place here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, is it's sunny. It even shows up on the flag, the state flag, right? And um, it's this kind of enchanted cultural and natural landscape. Yeah, and that's what draws people here. It's called the land of enchantment, right? And so the whole system we were looking at was around um, in Santa Fe, in the region, um, it was about how do humans integrate into this beautiful landscape. And um, on the top left and on the bottom are images from um, cliff dwellings and um, a Pueblo ruin in Frijoles Canyon and Bandelier National Park. And you may notice from these pictures that they're all passive solar, that they're oriented and built with the earth and plastered um, to catch the summer, I'm sorry, the winter sun and be shaded from the summer sun. And that image up there on the right is Taos Pueblo, where um, for at least a thousand years they've been doing the same thing. And um, we were work. go ahead, back for a second, Bill. So the nested systems was actually um, these layers of indigenous architecture, right? And this is the tradition we were building on. So go to the next one, please, Bill. Right, so um, because of the sun and because of all of these traditions, um, New Mexico early on became a place for green building and particular, particularly solar. Over on the right hand side is some early solar buildings by the New Mexico Solar Energy Association. And over on the left is a somewhat more modern solar building. On the bottom, you can see images of earthships, which also grew up here in New Mexico because of this tradition. Go to the next one, please, Bill. Yes, yeah, so in Living Structures, we were working with getting green building accepted into the mainstream, particularly straw bale. And one of the pieces about straw bale is the structural aspects holding up the roof can be cost prohibitive. You can see on the lower left, you might as well frame up the wall if you're going to do that kind of um, structural technique. And the other piece is that it's very expensive. The most cost 
prohibitive portion of straw bale building is stuccoing the outside and plastering the inside. They're very labor intensive. Go to the next one, please, Bill. So um, we did two things. We found two nodal interventions. One was to use really well-known hollow concrete blocks with um, steel rebar inside and poured concrete as the structural member holding up the roof with an insulated box beam. Go to the next one, please, Bill. And one of the things about using that structural technique is it's very well understood by all kinds of contractors and it's very well understood by all kinds of engineers and it's very well understood by all kinds of permitting authorities. So it was an easy sell. And the other piece was that in Santa Fe, New Mexico, pretty much any house is going to be stuccoed on the outside and plastered on the inside. So go to the next one, please, Bill. So these little nodal interventions of understanding what um, was traditional here, understanding what permitting authorities and engineers understood enabled us to make straw bell homes for the same square foot price as stick frame homes. And so the potential we were seeing was mainstreaming of modern regenerative, regeneration of traditional ways and the nodal intervention had to do with this interaction of sun and earth and those traditional ways of building integrated into modern ways of working on structures, creating ways of holding up the roof. So um, I hope these three examples gave you ideas of what it is that people love about places, giving you the key to the potential. And one of the things that um, happened for quite some time was that straw bale building um, was easily insured, easily mortgaged, and easily permitted here in the region. And one of the reasons it did not continue to grow in the ways that we had hoped to um, had a lot to do with what happens over and over in the construction industry is there's a downturn. About every seven years, there's a downturn. And so um, we were not able to make great inroads into the kind of real estate market aspects of the whole system that would enable this work to continue to grow and regenerate. And that's because we weren't able to make inroads into parts of the whole that are even more ingrained than engineering. Okay, so these principles are the ones we've been working with today. Can you go back for a second, Bill? The whole system, right? And we're asking you to think about the whole system of the neighborhood or the place you live in. Work from the potential of that place, that whole system, not from problems. And the way you do that is by working within nested systems and finding those nodal interventions, right? Okay, thank you, Bill. Go to the next one, please. Sure. So, oh, you wanna go, Joe? Uh, go ahead. So what we did last time is we had you reflect on not only the four, well, these seven principles, but we're hoping that we've generated some curiosity and some questions about what it might mean to think about these four, as well as the seven that we uh, talked about in general earlier. And so we'd like to have a, a question and answer period and to kick, so basically write, the, write down your questions if you can and let um, Hannah know uh, that you have some questions and we will call on you. But in the meantime, to kick this off, as we said in the beginning, we wanted to come back to this definition and to get any reflections on, um, from you on what this means to you. Has, has it, has it I, I, I want to say a couple things about it. Yeah, please. Right. So in all three of our examples, we were working on developing the capacity of the human and non-human living systems to realize their innate potential. Right? So in Brattleboro Co-op, we were looking at the potential of the landscape to provide food for people, to actually be farmed in a way that helped the rivers be healthier, that made the soil healthier, and made the people more aware of that and more capable of doing that, right? Because one of the things that was happening was, as Bill was saying, farmers were fleeing. Um, and one of the things that we saw in the co-op was that we, there was cheese from South America 
when they were very capable of producing all their own cheese, right? And this helped to engender um, Vermont being number one in local foods. And it's still 5% of the, the food of Vermont is provided locally, but that's the greatest percentage in any state in the union. In Brad's example, it was building the capacity of the people to realize the potential of the water that was running down their streets and to catch that water and to make their neighborhoods cooler and better to live in. And in the last example with living structures, it was about enabling people to have the capacity to create affordable and comfortable energy efficient homes that we didn't just do these large 4,000 square foot straw bales. We also helped owner builders do the same. Um, but the work we did with the large homes is what enabled those owner builders to not just be DIY off in the hills somewhere, but to actually get building permits and bank loans and mortgages and insurance to enable them to build their own homes in this sustainable, um, energy efficient way, right? So just I wanted to help unpack this a little bit by the three case studies we gave you, how we were looking at that, developing that capacity to realize potential and how the key of that is in what people love about the places. And it's kind of like the water that fish swim in. It's hard for us to mostly see it. In reflecting on the, the principle is work with potential, not problems. And what does innate potential, what does that, can you ground, have you been able to ground that in your own experience? What does that look like? Why do we talk about that innate potential? Wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you begin to identify those innate potentials. And are you bringing in experts to, to help with that? Or are you typically um, using your own expertise? Yeah, talk a little bit about that. So um, that could be a week long course and has been. And it's really um, one of the things that we have focused on is understanding places. And um, what we're looking for is patterns that repeat in the geological history and ecological history and the human history. And we do a lot of this by interviewing people. So we obviously look at maps and things like that. And we interview all kinds of experts, but in interviewing those experts, we're also interviewing them as residents, citizens, lovers of those places they're in. So we're getting both information and this more, um, what Nora Bateson would call warm data, this more contextualized holistic understanding of the place. And we work on um, kind of looking for three patterns. And then we hold those really lightly as useful fictions, as hypotheses, and listen to people telling us, oh, that one's right on, or you're a little off on this one, or that one's crazy, or right? So that this is, we're using the project as an instrument to enable a conversation that's about bringing to consciousness a self-awareness within a community. And um, then from there, we work into principles and this concept around how do we have the project be a nodal intervention to help realize that potential in the place. And what we're really aiming for through all these conversations is to have the stakeholders take this on long after we're gone. 
right? That the project is an opportunity to begin this capacity building, um, but we're only gonna be there so long. And that's why we really focus on this capacity building because otherwise um, it becomes entropic like anything else, right? And what inspires people is to see a vision of their future, vision for their children and all the rest. Um, and to come together in this collaborative field to help realize that and continue to help that be realized. Right? So it's not just a rigid thing. That potential is not a set thing. It's continuing to unfold just like the potential within a piece of land or a person or whatever else, a community, a neighborhood, that potential keeps unfolding in various ways. So okay. thank you. Uh -huh. Waldron asked a question, what wants to emerge here? He says he likes that question. We like that question too, Dave. Uh, so the, way, the question is, is, how do you actually tell what wants to emerge? And people basically, are, you hear a lot of people saying, well, we just wait, work for with emergence. Well, emergence comes out of a pattern. I mean, the, every place is unique. It just doesn't, uh, we don't get Boston turning into um, Tahiti overnight. So there's a unique uh, attribute that we have to honor in that place. So over, over the millennia, you can actually see patterns repeating themselves. And this is fundamentally a tracking effort. Trackers actually look for multiple points of triangulation, if you will, to validate that, oh, we see one track and then we see another. What does that mean? Do we have a deer or do we have a bear? So it all depends on uh, multiple points of contact. And we're, what we're doing with the community is helping them experience that and learning from them as well. So that collaborative learning generates a heck of a lot of positive inertia, if you will. And it's really important. One of the things that we found when we taught a class about doing this is you've got to have a project that you don't just go in and understand a place willy-nilly because it ends up being like a marketing thing and it gets more like place making instead of looking at the place source potential because those nested systems are going to be really different they're not just lines on a map if you're working on an agricultural project you're going to be looking at what are the agricultural systems you're nested within if you're working on a water project it may be the water systems that you're nested within. If you're yeah, working don't, don't. on an educational project, it might be the educational systems you're nested within because that's what the project is looking to shift. And that's why the co-op example, the Batterboard co-op example is useful. That was a food related issue that related to the food culture that was there. But if we were working with a machine shop, it might have been a whole, likely would have been a whole different set of relationships and holes we were working with. And that's also how you get paid for it. If it's just blue sky thinking, it doesn't, as Bill keeps saying, what is the value adding process you're trying to enable, right? And that could be a business, it could be a real estate development project, it could be an educational system. But that, that focus and that concreteness is essential to understanding, to, right? It's, it's Bucky Fuller's thing. If you don't have a good boundary, you can't do good work, but you have to realize that it's part of a larger whole. There's a building nearby that used to be the county water district's uh, building. It's no longer in use. It's been sitting vacant for about five years and it's now slated to be converted to uh, housing units, about 160 uh, odd housing units. The, it's a largely residential area, although in the immediate vicinity of the building, it's commercial. Um, most likely it, there'll be increased traffic. Uh, it's already very difficult to get around by bicycle and with increased auto, uh, auto traffic, it'll be even more difficult. So I'm just wondering, if, how would you approach this project? Who would you want to speak with? What questions would you ask? Um, how would you evaluate the area? Sure. Uh, Joel, I'm happy to take this unless you... Uh... 
Go for it. All right. Well, this will, Bruce, sorry, I'm going to give you a kind of a, um, it might be a non-answer, but out of it will come an answer, <laughs> is that we wouldn't start by looking at the problem. So you're pointing out the problem of mobility, transportation, um, uh, potential hazards, hazard, uh, hazardous condition for bicycle riders, et cetera. Yes, that will likely happen. But when we actually are brought in by a developer to work with the community, we ask the developer to put their ideas about what needs to be developed on hold. And what we tell the community we're working with is that we, the developer is actually coming to this community to do something. They deserve a profit for this, but they do not deserve to assume that this is the right usage for this site. Now it might be, I'm not saying it isn't. So what, what happens is that we work with the community as a whole system, including the developer, that everyone is a stakeholder, no more important or less important than the other. And then we collaboratively discover the potential of this place and what is actually really wanted and needed for this site. Now, it might be housing, probably it would be actually, mm -hmm. but what we want to do is make sure that we are all working together to understand that that need is what's really important there. And then we can actually look at the problem with that vessel, holding it by having the whole community hold that, okay, this is important. Now let's work together to solve it. Instead of getting in a fight back and forth of no, you know, no cars or all bikes, or how do we actually handle the roadway system? Or do we spend the money for a wider roadway system? Or do we get rid of the road? Those become value laden and ideal, ideal oriented questions that actually people argue around. But if we actually have the larger potential that the city needs this housing project, and people understand why, then we can actually collaboratively solve for all those other fragmented issues. Have you documented a, a, um, a project of yours from start to finish where you uh, explain step-by-step step how the project has evolved? Yeah, that would be, you know, we, have, we haven't to that level of detail. We certainly have lots of case studies, but it's exact what I just, downloaded is exactly what we do with communities. If you go to regenesisgroup.com, there's a whole bunch of case studies you can see. Um, there's a book, Regenerative Development and Design by Mang, Haggard, and Regenesis um, that has a bunch of case studies as well as kind of step-by-step -step how one does this. And um, what you laid out is precisely why we started doing this work is because most real estate development projects are because someone on the back of an envelope said, oh, I can get it for this much. The infrastructure will cost this much. It will cost this much to develop it and I can get this much in return, right? It's mostly looking at financial capital. It's not looking at developing the human capital, the social capital, the ecological capital, or even a lot of times the built capital or the infrastructure of the community, right? It's using those capitals mostly to gain more financial capital. And what we're mostly saying is if we wanna develop the value of a piece of the living earth, if we look at all of those five capitals, we're gonna be far more effective than if we're only focused on that financial capital. Because if we keep eroding all the other capitals to purely gain financial capital, those neighborhoods are no longer viable and they are no longer attractive and our real estate investment cannot be counted upon, right? And so Bill was then playing out the process of how one would do, how one would look at all of, at creating returns from all those five capitals in a continuing way. Bruce, did that hold together at all for you? It's going to take further examination, but yeah, the general, I mean, it's consistent with the general principles you've laid out for sure. Yeah. You know, we're working with two developers right now, one out of New York City and one in Chicago that actually work the same way. They don't do the ecological side of things, but they do the community side of things. Just to share with you how they work, they go into a community, they buy property, but they do not propose any project. 
They basically work with the community for one to two years to become part of the community. And then they decide together what project needs to be built, which is what very- What projects have they built? Uh, very big projects like New Rochelle, New York, uh, to name one, but very big projects. And the key there is they can afford to take that two years yeah. because they've been very successful in working in this way, mm. right? So they are one of the things that pushes most development projects is the interest clock, right? And, but here's, um, but here's, the, here's the thing. They actually make more money on these projects. They that's my point patient money, but they have no lawyers. I'm over exaggerating the point just to make the point, but no lawyers, no public relations firms, because you don't need them when you're working with in alignment with the community. And, and now, can, Bill, can you tell the name of the company? Yes, Impact Collective is one, and the other is Condor Development out of Chicago. Now, Impact Collective has a stronger understanding of, of uh, uh, they call it crowdsourced placemaking, which sounds a little mechanical, but they're really working with the community with that relationship over time. So we're a big fan of theirs. We have a question from Lynn. Um, Lynn, if you want to speak up and ask it, go for it or I can just read it. Yeah, so in San Diego, we have um, some well, we have the uh, San Diego Green Building Council and um, we're very active and we have the eco districts around town. So how does this uh, merge with that? It's a urban, more urban thing. Right. So and I'll let lead, Bill- A lead, a lead thing. Right, I'll let Bill give an answer to that, but um, those are all great things. And um, there's some levels that both of those are missing. Bill, would you go ahead, please? Yeah, I'm a big supporter of eco districts. I think they do a really good job. Um, I would just say that the distinction is, is that we are working with this place as a whole living system, as an organism that has potential that we're, and then as somebody asked, I guess it was Dave asked about emergence, you know, how do you actually, identify what wants to emerge. That's the one distinction I think that they are not addressing and I'm sure they will at some point, but uh, that's, uh, that's, what, that's the perspective we're bringing to this is that you actually need to understand the place on its own terms. And I like to say, when you do that, you help people fall in love with that place again, which is a great motivator. So I'll stop and with it. And the piece you didn't answer, Bill, is about the difference between this and LEED. This LEED is really focused in the building and on saving energy, saving water. It's not really focused on how would we use the building process, shifting the building process, so it actually built the capacity of the living systems of the place, human and non-human, to continue to regenerate themselves. And the real critical way I think about this is, are we imposing something? on those living systems or are we looking at them and proposing something? Yeah, and one example about LEAD is that, and I'm one of the founders of LEAD, so I think I can make these comments without the fear, is that um, LEAD is, I use LEAD now. I don't, we do regenerative projects, but the building itself, sometimes people want a LEAD certificate. That's perfectly fine. You want to do all the work you can to uh, create more efficiency in these mechanical worlds, but they're not the living, it's not the living stuff. When LEED actually ventures into the living world, it has problems. So I'll give you one idea. When LEED says you must keep prime farmland, or you get a point for keeping prime farmland, that assumes that prime farmland is good. And in fact, most prime agriculture is actually pretty destructive. So the, the broad brush approach to living systems that these kind of checklist approaches take actually can cause more harm if you, made it, if you don't understand the nature of that place. And this is, I want to say, this is why we're talking about the neighborhood and the context, because context is everything. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I am a Greenpoint Raider, you know, in San Diego. So um, 
residential actually is my focus. And um, so there's a lot of support down here for straw bale and all those things. Awesome. So the whole reason we've been doing this work is because Bill doing lead, me doing straw bale, me doing water harvesting, permaculture stuff, we realized that it wasn't going to get us where we need to go, right? That what we really need to do is regenerate communities rather than simply limit the damage, yeah? And being peripheral is not going to do it either. We have to figure out ways so those little changes can have systemic changes, right? Because many of us have done this work for decades and finally realized that nibbling around the edges wasn't going to make the difference. There needed to be some kind of change that created systemic change. Or else we'd have a lot of nice houses and a lot of nice gardens and a lot of nice even neighborhoods, but everything would be going down around us. Yeah, there's one comment here, which I think is an interesting one from Rudy. Uh, from my limited experience with learning about eco districts, all three programs work compatibly and fulfill gaps for the respective programs, lead, regeneration, eco districts. I would say that's true. And you have to avoid what conflicts and take what complements. It's really. So, so the idea here is being conscious of effect, not just doing a check the box because somebody else decided that's what meant green was. You know, for instance, USGBC said for many years that lead means you're doing sustainable buildings. No, you're not. This is, you know, do not believe, you know, we don't believe everything people say because sustainability is about a sustaining life. By just making buildings more efficient, we're not, we're working towards that, but we're not necessarily, the, in, those buildings in and of themselves are not sustainable. They are green and they are leading us towards a sustainable condition, but in and of themselves, they do not sustain life. As always, we do this for you. And so hearing from you what would be helpful is a gift to us. We love hearing from you. We love hearing what would be helpful. If you have other questions we didn't get to, we're, we're here to help make this um, accessible, understandable, help you with what you have going on. So feel free to shoot us an email. It's uh, in the chat now. You can find us online. Um, and otherwise, thank you so much uh, for coming. We'll stick around for just a few minutes if there's continuing questions, but feel free to leave as you need to. Um, thanks again. Miguel, and you will, you will be getting reading, a reading and an exercise once again. Um, and I hope you like it. Oh, has anybody, by the way, has anybody done, you, you can leave, don't worry, we're not keeping you, but it, <laughs> has anybody done um, any of the, the exercises that we've sent out? I think I missed them. Oh. It is 40% of your grade. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. I, I think I missed them. Did they come from Build It Green or where did they come from? They did. We send a follow-up email after each course with the recording if you want to watch again, as well as an additional reading to continue to explore ideas and an exercise to start to um, help kind of figure it out. Oh, so. great. Thanks. I'll look for it. Yeah, I'll look oh, for I need it. an extension. I didn't get it. <laughs> well, maybe we could send out all three of the readings and all yeah. three of the exercises this That's time. That's a good idea. That'd be great. Thank you. Good. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay. Well, good. well, then you'll have homework you over the break, but I guess that's Homework it. while we're on uh, Christmas vacation? Uh-oh. <laughs> it's a all puzzle. Right. We'll Think of it, it as a puzzle that you can play with over Christmas vacation. Oh. Yes. So please enjoy your holidays. We appreciate you coming and we'll hang out for another five or 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah hey, hey, Bill and Joel, I actually have a question. Thank you. This is actually really interesting. Um, so I work a lot with multifamily developers and a lot of them, you know, are just based, barely getting sustainability in their minds or, I mean, forget about regenerative thinking or I wouldn't say forget about it, but that's something that's very beyond their, we their, understand what you mean. <laughs> their focus. Yeah. So, yeah. So how do we start taking bites out of that? Um, that piece of pie, I guess. And how do we start looking or thinking regeneratively in an urban core with a production builder, you know, a traditional REIT, you know, how do we start bringing them into that fold and what conversations can we start having with them? I want to tell a story about this. 
um, and I'm sure Bill's got an answer too. Um, we were working with Newland Communities, which is the largest horizontal develop residential developer in the nation. So 40 projects a year, they're actually selling sections of lots to builders like Pulte and, you know, and um, they had a, they had a revolving, their partners revolved as who was the ED each year. And the executive director um, believed deeply in green. She was a reborn Christian and believed that the earth was ours to steward. And it was a sacred duty. And so she funded USGBC. She funded all kinds of things like that. And we worked with them for about a year. Um, and I was in Texas. I was working with a whole group of developers, um, one of whom I'd worked with for months. And he was somewhat interested, but not terribly interested. And he stood up and he raised his hand. He said, I was driving with my two teenage boys this weekend and I pointed out a place we're going to develop. And they slumped in the back seat, said, oh, dad, you're going to destroy that too? <laughs> and this man all of a sudden wanted to be the most sustainable regenerative developer in the world because he had always thought of himself as developing homes and communities for people. He didn't think of himself as a land raper and he couldn't stand that his children saw him in that way. And so we all desire to create meaning. We all want to have meaningful lives. There's all kinds of things that we care about. We want to leave a legacy. And so it shows up in different ways at different times. Um, also working with Newland, I was there to help uh, in a competition to redesign the Dallas Cowboys Stadium and the 50 acres of parking that surrounded it. And we got in these black Suburbans and drove to um, this Texas steakhouse. And I was the ecological guy at this big round table and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to communicate this stuff. And one guy starts to talk about horny toads. Remember we used to catch horny toads as a kid? Oh, yeah, yeah. And we'd have little ranches and we'd feed them ants. And, oh, and you don't see them anymore. And fireflies. Remember we used to catch fireflies? You don't see them anymore. And I realized I was done, right? They had revealed why they cared about this thing. And my job was to help show them how they could use their caring. They were just doing what they knew how to do, right? And so the raising of the bar or the not raising of the bar wasn't because they didn't care, it's because they had no idea how to do it, right? And especially they didn't know how to do it and make money, which was their key um, job, right? So a lot of this has to do with Show, helping people see that what's even possible, right? Because we all only know what we know. Not every developer is a candidate for this kind of work because depending on where they are and what their, what their core beliefs are and what's meaningful to them. But what Joel more than hinted at is if we take the time to find that out rather than just diving in, to actually take a step back and find out what core beliefs are and principles, values that people hold, it allows for an entirely different discussion than solving the problem, right? So again, looking for their potential instead of addressing the immediate problem that they have in front of them, that will open up a conversation where you can begin to, it may, not with everybody, but it may. So, so slow it down to expand it, right? To, to expand their worldview for a moment to say, well, how, how can this project actually address those things that are meaningful to you? And share some stories. Um, this kind of stuff is happening more and more. Happy to share stories with you too that you can use, Mo, because that's what it takes, building on what people have done. Okay, Miguel. Yeah, I was um, wondering how you can use your, your process. You said that in the past you had the, the idea is to scale it up. So how can we scale this up? So planners and local governments, municipalities, and so the, the higher uh, tier up can buy into this process. I know that, for example, Carol Sanford, your, your colleague, she's getting into businesses, but um, I think that there's a space like planners and, and as I said, municipal officials building 
building uh, permit departments, natural resources, and etc. How can they uh, be brought into the fold so they they use this process as part of the as part of their construction, development, and planning process? Well, I've got a perspective, a uh, quick one. I'll try not to make, a, make, to make it quick so Joel has a chance to answer. Um, what we have found, I'll give you an example. In, in Chile, uh, we worked on a big project and the mayor demanded and commanded us not to speak to their planning group and their sustainability department because she felt, you know, who are we? And we could be subverting her, her agenda. Um, but by working in the community in the ways that we've been discussing, it took about a year before she called our client up and said, okay, I see what you guys are doing. This is really cool, count us in. And so what I'm trying to say is that instead of forcing it on somebody, what we're doing is we're building a field of, if you will, energy of people that are interested in working this way. And if you keep that field of a group of people working together for about a year, it begins to uh, permeate a community. People's people talk. Uh, so that's ultimately the most powerful way is for people to actually want want it rather than being force fed it. So that's my perspective. Yeah. So I would use the same principles we just went through, right? If we're talking about shifting the building culture that we would look for what is the potential of the building culture and how would we find those nodal interventions, right? And I think those nodal interventions have everything to do with um, all the things we're talking about is that if I'm a builder or I'm a permitter or I'm a lender, if I can actually see the potential of playing my role differently, that's what's going to make me want to play. That's what Bill is saying. And so um, Regenesis was formed 20 some years ago to shift the development industry. And one of the nodal interventions we made was to introduce the idea of regenerative development and that it was developing the value of all pieces of the living holes of places. And one of the measures of success is that even AIA has taken on the word regenerative. You cannot turn around today and not see that word regenerative. And people are often beginning to use the phrase regenerative development in addition to regenerative design. So the way that all living systems shift is through some nodal intervention, through viral change, right? It's a tiny little change that spreads out and multiplies logarithmically, right? As we're very familiar with these days because of COVID. And most of that has to do with the human mind and our perspective. So if we can start to get this idea in people's minds that humans are not by nature destructive and that we could actually provide for our food and fuel and fiber and energy in ways that help build living systems instead of regenerate, instead of degenerate, that's an idea most of us have never thought about, let alone heard about, because it's not even the message of the sustainability movement. The message of the sustainability movement is leave no trace, right? What if that was the motto of my marriage? Humans the most, that the biggest thing I was trying to do was not damage my wife and children, right? It's not an inspiring message and it doesn't give me much room to move or be creative and love myself in, right? So that is the primary viral message we are trying to spread is that we as humans can be regenerative instead of degenerative. And I think that's a great place for us to end tonight. Thank you all for coming. I agree. Thank, thanks everybody. We hope you again, join us on January 7th if you can. And, um, as always, questions and get answered, uh, throw them to us in an email, throw them in the chat as you're leaving and uh, we'll try to get to them. Thanks so much for joining. And if any of you wanna contact us, you can send an email to Bill DeGreen and they'll forward it to us and we'll get back to you.